um, I came upon it when I was visiting uh, the IBC, Indian Design Center, uh, the Design Center at the IIT Mumbai. And it was being done for a children's project, some project going on. It's a lovely story. And I thought it's a very powerful story, but it helps me explain many, many, many things. So I'm going to tell you the story for, to the child in you. Not to you, but to the child in you. So once upon a time, the gods decide to have a conference, very much like this. And they decided to meet atop Mount Kailas. And all the gods came in their vahanas, or their vahanas, which are different animals. So Surya, the sun god, came on a horse, a stallion. Chandra, the moon god, came on an antelope. Ganga came on a dolphin. Yamuna came on a turtle. Brahma came on a swan. Vishnu came on a hawk or an eagle called Garuda. And when they reached Mount Kailas, they would stop at the base. And the gods would climb the mountain while the Vahans would stay behind like good drivers. And all the gods would rise up. And they, while walking towards Mount Kailas, they would have to pass the gates. And at the gates was a bird. And the bird was singing a beautiful song to welcome the gods. So, and all the gods loved this song. They would look at the sweet bird singing a song. They would bless the bird and move forward up the mountain. So Surya blessed the bird, Chandra blessed the bird, Ganga blessed the bird, Yamuna blessed the bird, Brahma blessed the bird, Vishnu blessed the bird. Now the last of the gods to arrive was Yama, the god of death. And he came on a buffalo. He got down from the buffalo and he made his way towards the entrance and he saw this little bird singing this beautiful song. But unlike all other gods who had smiled and blessed the sparrow, he frowned, he crinkled his forehead, he shook his head this way and that and then he stomped up the mountain looking positively furious. Garuda, the hawk, observed this and wondered what had gone wrong. Did Yama not like the bird, the bird song? So he said, I must do something to protect this bird because Yama, the god of death, doesn't like it and could hurt the bird or curse the bird or break its wing. I must save this bird. So he took the bird in the palm of his hands and flew over seven mountains and seven rivers to a forest far away. And there, on a mango tree full of succulent mangoes, he left the bird and said, you are safe here, lots of food to eat, no singing, just eating, have a good time, away from the gods and their capriciousness. And then he flew back over the seven mountains, over the seven rivers and returned to Mount Kailas. And by the time he returned, the conference had come to an end. And all the gods were descending from the mountain slope and leaving for their respective abodes. So Surya left on his horse, Chandra left on his antelope, Ganga left on her turtle, Yamuna on the turtle, everyone Brahma on his swan, and then Vishnu comes down with Yama, with a smile on his face. And Yama looks at the gate and sees there is no bird, there is no song. And Garuda watches his reaction carefully. And Yama smiles. He heaves a sigh of relief and says the account books are balanced. <laughs> and Garuda asks, I don't understand. What do you mean account books are balanced? He said, when I came here, I saw a little bird singing a beautiful song and all the gods seemed to be blessing the god and I also wanted to bless it. Very nice song. When I suddenly remembered, as per my account books, this bird is supposed to die today. But not here. Aww. It is supposed to die 
across the seven mountains, across the seven rivers. At the mango tree, there is a python which is waiting to eat it. And I can just hear the gulp. Thank you, Garuda. <laughs> You see, so this is a children's story. <laughs> but is it a children's story? And yet when the story is told in this very nice way, it sort of disarms you, makes you vulnerable, and then the strike comes. And something hits, something has happened. Because what is the story trying to tell? And you start thinking about it. Is Garuda a hero or a villain? Neither. I'm talking to the child in you. Villain. Don't give me postmodern answers. Villain. It depends. It depends on who you ask. If you ask the python who was starving for the last one year, waiting for someone to bring it food, Garuda is Annadatta. <laughs> but since you have fallen in love with the sparrow, which the storyteller manipulated you to, you feel sorry for the sparrow. Because for the sparrow, Garuda was an interfering twat. <laughs> Do you suffer from savior complex? <laughs> Storytelling has the power to communicate extremely complex ideas. I always tell people, why were the Puranas written? Puranas are about 2,000 years old. The Vedas are 4,000 years old. Why did the Puranas come into being? The, the fundamental difference between the Vedas and the Puranas is the Puranas are based on narrative. They are based on plot. They are based on stories. Characters. Vedas don't have plot. And character. They're there, here and there, a little bit here and there, but they're not in central. Central in the Veda is the ritual, the way it is conducted, the chanting. Nothing else is central. The ritual is central, the chanting is central, the melody is central, the process is central. But the Puranas are lush with stories. It is about sensory, sensory. It is full of emotions. This huge transformation from what is called the Nigama Parampara to the Agama Parampara is a huge transformation because they are trying to communicate an idea. A ritual will only communicate this much. A ritual for those who don't is actually a performance art in which you are immersed. The most popular ritual in the world, anybody has an idea? Currently, for the current generation, what's the most popular ritual in the world? Sharing photos. <laughs> ritual, it has to be choreographed. The birthday party. It's a choreographed performance. You can't serve masala dosa. The sacred thing is a cake on which you light lamps and blow it out. <laughs> it's a choreographed performance. It's choreography. And if you participate in it, you enjoy it. If you step out of it and judge it, you don't get it. You know, you'll always have that one person saying, I don't believe it. You say, I'm nastic. The rest have fun. A ritual is a performance, it's a choreographed performance that you have to practice, you have to be part of. 
but storytelling. So in, in, in a ritual, I perform it. In a story, it is highly cognitive. I'm hearing it. Therefore, the Nati Shastras were called the fifth Veda. Because through stories, you're evoking a whole bunch of sensory stimuli and emotions. And the sensory stimuli and emotions, rasa and bhav, are the vehicle in which the idea is located. So that is why a character on stage is called a patra. Patra means a vessel. He's a vessel of what? A vessel of sensory stimuli, ras, emotions, bhava. And then the magic, the idea. Three things. So a good story has to have all these three layers. Ras, bhav, or uske baad vichar. Vichar is the last thing, not essential. What is essential is ras. If there is no ras, the child will not pick it up. So all the drama of storytelling is primarily the ras. Then the emotion. So I, I created ras on stage through just words and through some gestures, through the intonations of my voice. I'm creating through dramatic pauses. I'm creating ras. I'm establishing a highway to your heart. Slowly, very slowly, you have to work on it. And once the ras starts to flow, I start moving towards bhav. So once the sensory stimulus, so visual, what is sensory stimulus? I'm talking about the gods who are riding animals. The sun god riding a horse, the moon god riding an antelope. A little surprise, Ganga on her dolphin. How many people thought of Makara and wondered why is he calling it dolphin? Those games were being played. Everything is strategic. Everything is strategy. Two male gods, two goddesses, lots of women in the room. <laughs> Two goddesses come, not the popular ones, not suddenly someone, you have heard them, but they're not central. Normally it would be a Lakshmi or a Durga. No, get strategy. So now you lean forward. Oh, he's going to take us to a new place. Then a familiar god, Brahma. Familiar god, Vishnu. Slightly familiar. Once the rust has been established, I talk about this beautiful sparrow. And I try to make you invest in the sparrow emotionally. Fifteen minutes ago, the sparrow did not exist. Now you're mourning for it. <laughs> this is now bhav ki dunya mein. So from ras you move to bhav. The emotion, the investment, the heartbreak, the hope, the tragedy. And then the life. Panchatantra is designed to give you good values. So it is parental propaganda. Ye sunne ke baad mere bachche achhe nagri bani. Aur shayad mujhe old home pe nahi dali. That's a parable. Basically your Clever adults ability to manipulate children's minds. <laughs> so I'm, that's the world of parables. You know, Angur Khatte Hai, Aesop Ne Kaha, Kis Ne Kaha? How do you know the Angur Khatta Tha? Mecha Ho Ga, Baut Hi Mecha Tha, Tum Ne Nei Khaya. Mene Toh Khaa Nei Ho. So the whole thing of parable is prescriptive. It is trying to tell you to function in a particular way. It has an agenda. All stories have agenda, but it is a very immediate agenda to bring behavioral transformation. That's a parable. So it has a moral ending. Seek. Jatakas can be told as a parable, but it is not a parable. 
Unfortunately, people tell the Jatakas like a parable. They tell it with a moral ending. Jatakas are trying to establish the concept of rebirth, karma. Before the Jatakas, nobody in India, in the common man, was aware of rebirth. Punnar Janama idea emerges really in popular lore through Jataka. Because how did Buddha become the Buddha? Oh, because he has accumulated merit of his previous lives, 557 lives, he has become the Buddha. So if you Jendu are as compassionate as him, as generous as him, you will also become the Buddha. So there is a parabolic side to it, but what it is establishing is a paradigm. This Jataka is told only in places of in the world where rebirth is popular. So you find it in Thailand, in Cambodia, Burma, China. Rebirth, rebirth, rebirth stories. If this story was not told, how would people know about rebirth? Ramayana doesn't really talk about rebirth. Mahabharata doesn't really. They're, they're there, but on the side edges. Jataka is just about rebirth. That's the purpose of the Jataka. Bodhisattva. <coughs> Accumulation of merit. So basically you're telling people what is called tit for tat karma. <laughs> now, karbhala to pahala is a nice thing. As you sow, so you reap. <laughs> Isko karma ko tit for tat karma bote. But in the Mahabharat, when karma is spoken about, Krishna says tit for what karma? Not tit for tat. Tit for what? Because you can save a bird or you think you are saving a bird but the outcome doesn't match the intention. You began by trying to save the bird but what happened? You ended up killing it. You wanted to be a savior but you ended up as a killer. So you say, what karma? As you sow, so you reap. That's not correct. So now it has become complicated. Because Jatakas was simple, right? You do good, good, good things, you become the Buddha. Abhi bhi achha kolo na, achha karo, achha karo ki the job milega. Tell that to all those unemployed youths right now. He'll beat you with a stick. Because life is not simple. How do you tell a child that life is not simple? How do you prepare them for the horror of life? Or do you want to fool them into happily ever after? You should be selling those stories outside the divorce courts. <laughs> because all those boys and girls heard Disney telling them again and again, happily ever after. It's not true. You're like, oh. <laughs> what story do I tell? Because you are taking away hope. And that is the challenge of the storyteller. Patre ke andar vichar kya hai? Do you want to give them your assumptions about life? Or do you want to share and prepare them for the horrors of life? How you tell the story will determine that. नहीं मैं अपने बच्चों को अच्छी-अच्छी चीजें बताऊंगा ठीक है पर दुनिया अच्छी नहीं है ना <laughs> तो तुम झूठ बोल रहे हो बच्चे को <laughs> नहीं मैं उसको नागरिक बना दूं नो डिफरेंट फ्रॉम पॉलिटिशियंस राइट व्हाट इज द पॉलिटिकल वर्जन ऑफ हैप्पी एवर आफ्टर
Now this is how you will tell the story. Now look at the story of the eagle. Garud ki achhe He thought he was doing something good. And the horror of his life. He has to live with the guilt of the squealing and screaming sparrow. Cursing him as he's being swallowed by the pipe. <laughs> He thought he was doing a noble deed, right? Karbala to Pabala. He used to live with the guilt of killing that poor sparrow. But at the same time, he is hearing the relief and the gratitude of the python. At the same time, Koyu se Kroor Nirdei bol raha hai, Koyu se Annadata bol raha hai. It is happily ever after for the python. It is not a tragedy for the python. It's a happy ending for the python. On that day, he ate. It is not that there are no happily ever afters, but they are not for everyone. And the horror of life is you may not be that everyone. How do you prepare your child for that? How do you tell the child it's okay? The prince is not for you. Or will you tell the child, all princes are horrible. Angur <laughs> khatta. <laughs> because life is not predictable. Why shouldn't I dream of happily ever after? <laughs> Sanatan Satya is, it is true, it is also not true. That is, a, Sanatan means timeless. It is what you make of it. That is the meaning of the word Sanatan. Something which is timeless. People have always tried to do good deeds and the outcome of good deeds is simultaneously good and bad. Someone is fed and someone is dead. So, a man comes to your house and says, Mujhe bhook lagi hai. Khana doge? Will you feed him? Yes. Oh, by the way, that man's name is Ravan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Will you take the risk of stepping out of the house and feeding him? Or do you want to be safe inside your house and let him starve? Talk to the Europeans and their immigration policy. Because <laughs> every immigrant looks like our no. Because Hamari Sanskriti ko tod dega. Hamari betio ko nikal lega. The horror of the stranger at the door. Because the one, the hungry beggar, can also be the abductor. Both truths exist simultaneously. Vahi sanatan satya hai. Wo bhuka bhi hai, wo chor bhi hai. Which side do you want to see? What do you want to tell your child? This or that or both? And when you do that, when you train him to see both, sanatan satya aata hai. He Happily ever after is accompanied by horror also. Saat saat hota This is how stories can be told. So they can move from the mythological, from the parabolic, which is trying to give a point of view, to the mythological, which is trying to give multiple points of view and complex structures of existence. So you move from tit for tat, achhe karoge to achha hoga, to tit for what? That you can only control your actions, but you can never be sure of the outcome. Beej bo sakte ho. There are no guarantees of the phal, the fruit. The phal ki chinta mat karo. Seb lagao ge amrud milega. This is how a story which begins with a bird, a sparrow, moves on from parable.
parables, to mythologies, to Ramayana, to the immigration policy of Europe. That is how you prepare the storytelling. And this is the power of storytelling. And I am so glad that I have been able to write. These are some of the children's books I have been writing. I have written about three and the fourth one is right now being produced. The first one, I wrote this and the reason I want to bring this up today is because it's a little sad story over here. Because this is my first children's book, a set of six books uh, called Devlok series, um, the books before the serial came on. And this was called F Fun in Devlok. And the illustrator was a friend of mine who recently committed suicide. Ah. So it was very painful for me. And um, very, very painful because I, I remember uh, how we worked on these illustrations and how we realized this is the first time I was writing a children's story. And this was the first time he was illustrating something. Um, and, you know, uh, horrible things happen. I had not read it for a long time. When I heard the news, I was shocked. I thought everything was fine. But you see, not everything has a happy ending. But this embarked me on the journey to write children's stories. And I wrote this in the second one on animals, Pashu. Because I wanted to children in India. This was slightly chauvinistic. Because people knew basilisks and trolls, but they didn't seem to know Uchaisha, the flying horse, or Kakabhusandi, the talking crow, or Karkotaka, the serpent. Somehow, people seem to know basilisk, but not. And I said, no, let's try to bring this out. And then I finally decided to write the Ramayana for children. And uh, I called it the girl who chose. Because in the Ramayana, Sita makes five choices. And this is not my reading of it. This is what Valmiki wrote. If you want to find out what the five choices are, please buy mine. <laughs> <laughs> we have a bookstore right outside. <laughs> and now I'm writing the Mahabharat for children. It's just being designed. And it's called The Boys Who Fought. Wow. Thus, <laughs> the ability to get it. How do you tell the child complex stories without compromising? You don't want to compromise. I will not compromise on Ramayana. I will not make, change the story. I want to tell the story. Ramayana is the story of a woman who chose, who marries a man who cannot choose. It's a love story of a bird which flies, who falls in love with a bird inside a cage. <clears throat> and the bird inside the cage is Mariada Prashottam Ram. Not quite patriarchal, is it? <laughs> because we are conditioned to think in a particular way. And I'm very, very wary of people who force us to look at scriptures in a particular way. When I read the Ramayana, I find so much of feminism there, so much of humanism there. I don't see the patriarchy. It's my gaze, and I'm entitled to my gaze, and I'm entitled to my gaze, and I want to share this gaze to the children I don't have. I have no children, but I want children to know that there is a different way to look at Ramayana. I want girls out there to know that Sita chose. She took decisions. Not all choices worked out. <laughs> Some were painful, but they were her choices, her mistakes to make. Please don't tell her a parable. Don't give food to hungry men. <laughs> and tell her that even if you're cast in the forest, it's a great life. You can get up whenever you want, and take a bath whenever you want, and your life is not regulated by royal rules. It could be fun. You don't need the approval of a man. How do you tell that to children? That you don't need the approval. You don't need a, a man to kiss you and wake you up. You don't have to wear virginal white to make him happy. You can raise your children on your own. Two children, single mother story, Ramayana. Why not? Single father, of course, Shakuntala. 
to his becoming. All this from our scriptures. And of course the boys who fought. When is it okay to fight? And can I fight someone without hating them? Is it possible to fight someone without hating them? And when I can fight someone without hating them, it is called dharma. Because I fight you for justice, not because you are evil, but because you are just being unfair. When hundred brothers cannot share their kingdom with five cousins, we have a problem. And to stand up is a good thing. But you don't need to hate them, they're just stupid children. <laughs> whose father was blind and whose mother was blindfolded. So yes, they are not good children. They are nasty boys. But their father never saw them and their mother refused to see them. A little compassion, please. Even though we shall kill all. <laughs> <laughs> These are the scriptures which are written to prepare us for life. And that is how you tell the children. Let's not fool them with what is out there. Life is tough. Thank you. Questions, please raise your hands. Fastest finger first. One there. Can we have the microphone there, please? Thank you, sir. It's always a joy listening to you. Uh, coming back to your point about mythology and the stories that prepare you for life, you know, there are many stories that are very cruel. Like my son, I told him the story of Ganesha when his head is chopped off. It's, uh, I don't see the other side to it. And it horrified him so much that he would never go near a Ganesha for a long time after that. So how do you how do you look at these stories and what is the human side of that, those kind of stories? Imagine telling a child that it is possible for a virgin to become pregnant. Is that horrifying or not? Child doesn't know what virgin But you have to explain, right? <laughs> One has to be careful. Is it horrifying for a virgin to be pregnant? Not unless the kid's Jesus. Hmm? Not unless the kid's Jesus. Well, a virgin being pregnant is okay? I don't think so. I mean, at least you have to have sex. What I'm saying is, stories are horrible. Not just Hindu stories. Yeah. One has to be careful when you ask these, think about this, because bad things happen around the world. Do we feel our ancestors who wrote these stories were fools who wanted to frighten their children? Or is it a new revelation of the 21st century? Because these stories, do you really believe that Sun God rides a chariot with seven horses? If that is not true, but I can enjoy that story's fantasy, why can't I enjoy the fantasy of a man who cut his son's head and replaced it with an elephant's head? They are all fantasies. It's not a father cutting a son's head. It's how you tell the story. Why is it okay to tell the story? Which story is acceptable? Is it okay to tell the story of seven dwarves taking care of a single girl? What does taking care mean? Sounds a little creepy. Because if I start bringing adult meanings into it, fairy tales are scary. They are dark and horrific. So 
So one has to be very careful which story is acceptable. Eating a fruit and you're kicked out of heaven 